Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, actually, I have a first slide that makes the point that Sally was uh, just introducing me. Uh, energy efficiency is the other renewable resource. So this is about a renewable resource. And certainly in the energy debate, people generally refer to energy efficiency as a resource. Uh, in the California electricity market, it is actually the first resource in the loading order. That is, it's what's supposed to be used first to meet the demand. Um, and there are all sorts of energy efficiency. I assume people are familiar with the concept, making insulating buildings, making appliances more energy efficiency, improving fuel economy. Uh, much of this is argued to be a good investment even without thinking about the externalities that people can actually save money um, by, in, uh, by uh, investing. But there's this active debate about how much it actually saves in practice versus in models. And a big part of that is rebound. Rebound is the idea that when people make investments in energy efficiency, they change their behavior in ways that takes back some of that savings through either using their, the newly energy efficient appliance, I'm using the word appliance broadly, including cars, toasters, and whatever, um, using it more, or because they're saving money by going out and doing other things that use energy. And so rebound has become a real central part of the debate. There's a lot of large literature on rebound. And when I started trying to figure this out, I noticed that the terminology being used was used um, fluidly, uh, in, often in ways that were pretty confusing. Usually there's a discussion of direct rebound, which is generally the idea of using a good more once it becomes cheaper to use it because it's more energy efficient. And then indirect rebound, which is used much more broadly, but generally means gaining wealth from this improved energy efficiency and as a result spending it on stuff, but it actually is more broadly mean, used to mean everything except direct rebound. Um, and then there are these other issues, and one of them I'm going to talk about a bit today is innovation. Um, so Jevons wrote this article, this book in 1865 about coal, arguing that the invention of the steam engine actually increased the use of coal because the invention of the steam engine not only made steam engines, or the improvements in steam engine not only made it more efficient, but actually changed it in ways that made it much more usable for a broader range of things, including transportation. Uh, that concept has been around the whole time, but it got revived by Owen when he wrote this article in the New Yorker in 2010 that was mostly, uh, I think, misguided that tended to say uh, every bit of energy growth that we've had is a result of improved energy efficiency. So the energy use growth has just been massive and is, and is more than 100%. The 100% threshold is referred to in the literature as backfire. That is when you make something more energy efficient and as a result of it being be more energy efficient, you change your behavior in other ways that actually your total energy use goes up as a result. And so Owen argued for backfire. The best thing that came out of the article was this great graphic, which I have stolen without copyright. So please don't show that part of the video. Um, so there, as I said, there are diverse views on the size of rebound. There are a bunch of researchers who find very small rebound, though they're generally just, those re the research generally just is estimating this direct rebound, how much more are you using it. Owen and others argue that they're looking too narrowly at direct rebound, and that's almost certainly true. Um, but it's also almost certainly true that Owen and many of the people who argue about for backfire are looking too broadly. Uh, they essentially look at all the innovation in energy use and apply and based on that uh, and use that to infer that all the growth in energy use is a result of that innovation. Now there are a lot of things that have gone on in society since 1865 that aren't about energy efficiency and have made us wealthier and when we get wealthier we use more energy. And so it's really this, this idea that you can pin all of that energy growth on, on efficiency innovation uh, is clearly overstating the argument. So what I tried to do is take a piece of this argument, and that's all I'm going to do today, is look at the consumer side. And I just want to be clear, because I get a lot of critiques about this. 
There is a lot more to energy efficiency. Firms become more energy efficiency, efficient, and that changes the way they behave. I'm not going to cover that today, although I think the framework I'm going to show here is applicable there. But that's not where I'm focused today. Finally, we have to remember that nobody really cares about energy use. That's an inflammatory way of saying it, but in reality, that's not what we're really talking about when we talk about energy efficiency. We're talking about things like reducing pollution. We're talking about things like enhancing energy security, relieving bottlenecks sometimes, in the, particularly in the grid, um, or just encouraging people to make investments in things that are welfare enhancing. The actual total use of energy is almost never interesting from a policy point of view. If it were all coming from renewables, people would not care about it for the most part, if it were cost effective as well. So I'm going to, when I, at the end, I'm going to come back. I'm going to focus on energy efficiency, but I want you to keep this in the back of your mind that we're actually thinking more broadly than energy efficiency. And I'm actually going to talk about GHG efficiency and GHG rebound. Uh, to look at greenhouse gases as well. OK, so here's the model. And there's a bit of math, but I'm going to skip most of it. Um, but here's the basic idea. We're going to think of a very simple technology. You own something, or you're about to buy it. And if you pay a little extra, you can make it more energy efficient. You can make some payment to buy the more energy efficient version of it that has two effects. First, it changes the, the performance of the appliance in that it uses less energy when you run it, and it costs less because it uses less energy. But secondly, you have to make an upfront investment, and that also uses energy. It costs something up front, and it, costs, it has some embedded energy in that upfront investment. We're going to examine the impact of this, uh, of energy efficiency on investment, if it's cost effective. And also, if it's not cost effective, and I'm going to argue that the not cost effective should play a much bigger role in the discussion than it has so far. So we'll skip through. There's a bunch of stuff, and I'm not going to spend time on it. Um, and then I'm going to get to this equation. I, you obviously aren't going to know what it is, but let me just point out what there, there are a bunch of terms. The first term is what I call the static energy efficiency improvement. If you just improve the energy efficiency and didn't, and didn't change behavior, this first term, this is an equation for the change in total energy use, this first term is the embedded energy in the, that it took to improve it, and then the savings um, from using it. The second term is generally what's called indirect rebound. It's from actually getting richer. There's a delta I in there. Uh, a partial a derivative of, of I of income and what you spend it on. Because when you get richer, you just spend it on something, and that something uses energy, and it accounts for that. Um, the third term actually is also that income effect, but it's actually the income effect on the good that got more energy efficient, because that's one of the things you buy more of. The fourth term is the substitution effect. That is the idea that when something gets cheaper to use, you do more of it because now that's cheaper relative to spending on other stuff. And what I'm doing here is I'm translating this broad discussion, which usually is poorly defined, into pretty concrete, well-understood economic terminology. And it's going to be useful in a moment to, because it's going to allow me to point out some of the inconsistencies in the literature. And one of them is this fifth term. This fifth term is almost always ignored. And this fifth term says, if you substitute two using some more of this thing, and income is held constant, the only way you can do that is by substituting away from using something else. That is, there is this substitution away effect. And that saves energy, because whatever you were spending on the money on, you're not spending it on that anymore. And that's virtually always lost in this debate. Okay. So there's some direct implications. One of them I've just mentioned, that income effect rebound is distinct from this elasticity or substitution effect. And in particular, when you get richer, regardless of why you got richer, you, you, you buy more stuff, and that, makes you, and that uses more energy. Separately from that, when using one good gets cheaper, due to energy efficiency, you substitute towards using that good. But 
You substitute away from using something else. This has largely been ignored because people generally mush it in with the income effect and say, well, yeah, but you're getting richer. And in a moment, I'm going to argue you're not necessarily getting richer. And so if that's the case, what you're actually doing is when you use more of this good, you've got to account for the fact that you're using less of something else. This isn't a great economic insight. It's an economist. This is sort of a, just a boring equation. But it seems to be largely ignored um, within the energy efficiency rebound discussion. This aggregate income effect from re, uh, income effect rebound is almost certainly positive if there are net savings from energy efficiency. And well, there is certainly a debate going on about how large those savings are. There, the debate actually has two components to it. One is, are people actually, the, are the engineering estimates not always right? And so people are making investments that are, have bad payoffs. The other, which has been largely ignored that I'm going to get to in just a second, is are we actually counting the full income effect? And I'm going to argue that in many cases, we're not counting the full income effect. And in fact, we're, counting, we're failing to count a negative income effect that lowers energy use. I'll get back to that in a second. Then the point I just made, we have to think about net direct rebound. When we talk about direct rebound, it's not just using this good more. It's also using some other good less. And so if we're going to count using this good more as rebound, we have to count using some other good less as an offset to that. And we, what matters is the net effect. And that's always going to make the direct rebound smaller. And then total rebound can be negative. This is actually recognized in the literature. This is the idea that you get a more energy efficiency, efficient appliance. If you had not changed behavior at all, let's say it would have saved uh, 6 million BTUs per year, and in fact, it saves six and a half. Why? Well, one thing is you might actually be substituting away from something that's even le more, even less energy efficient. And this is why we have to take into account not just what you're substituting towards, but also what you're substituting away. Another is these actually may be bad investments from an income effect point of view. That is, people may actually be getting poorer from investing in these things. And just as getting richer makes you consume more, getting poorer makes you consume less. Now, why would that happen? Because in most markets that we talk about energy efficiency, the price the consumer is facing is not really the marginal cost to society. There are, two basic, there are two markets we generally talk about. One is utilities, that is electricity and natural gas. And it is well known that in electricity and natural gas, your retail price is way above the marginal cost most of the time. Now, it's also time bearing. But on average, what you're paying at retail is much higher than the marginal cost of supplying more electricity. What does that mean? Well, the other case is fuels. And in fuels, in the United States, we charge a little more in Europe, we charge a lot more than the marginal cost because they're taxes. What that means is that when people are making private decisions to invest in energy efficiency, they're making it based on the price they face. But there's an income effect beyond their personal gain, and that is the income effect on the other side of the market. When they buy less, the income of the seller goes down. Now, economists generally ignore this. In competitive markets, you should ignore it, because if price is actually equal to marginal cost, that seller is close to indifferent to that last unit of sale, because they're not making any money on it. But that's not the case. So let me just give you a quick numerical example. Let's say the price of electricity is 10 cents a kilowatt hour. And let's say that the true marginal cost of supplying the marginal unit of electricity is 7 cents a kilowatt hour. That extra 3 cents is doing things like paying for the fixed cost of the grid. Now, you go out and you invest in energy efficiency. Why? Because the investment, you think, is going to save you more money than the, the, the investment is going to save you more money priced at 10 cents a kilowatt hour for that electricity than it's going to cost you up front. And that's why you invest in it. You make money on it. What you don't count is that when you have now cut your electricity use, the seller just lost 3 cents on every kilowatt hour. 
because they were making three cents profit on that marginal kilowatt hour because electricity is priced above marginal cost. So uh, well, it has a positive income effect for you, it has a negative income effect for somebody else. That somebody else is the shareholders of the utility, or it's the other rate payers because the utility has to raise rates in order because they still have to cover the cost of their investment. So a lot of energy efficiency that may actually be cost effective privately may not be cost effective socially because energy is priced so high above marginal cost. Even if it's not so far that it's actually a negative income effect, it is certainly a smaller income effect than you would get simply by looking at the private uh, case. Now, this is a deviation from standard economic models where uh, competitive models where price is equated to marginal cost. But energy markets are the poster child for that deviation. We price electricity way above marginal cost and we price fuels above or in, well, actually in parts of the world we part, price it below marginal cost. But in the, in the developed world we generally price it above marginal cost and in Europe, we price it way above marginal cost. So when you make that investment in the more energy efficient car, uh, you, are, you may be privately saving money, but the government is now not getting the tax revenue. And they, that's, that was real revenue. That was real wealth that somebody else is not getting. And you're not counting that in your investment. So when price deviates from marginal cost, the income effect has to be extended beyond this private uh, uh, decision making to include all of the parties that are affected by this decision and that systematically goes in the direction of making the income effect smaller because these things are generally priced above marginal cost. Some people might say, well, that, what about externalities? Externalities also cause pr price to deviate from social marginal costs, but that analysis isn't the same. It differs in an important way. Externalities are not something that just translate as cash. Externalities you can think of as a forced consumption bundle. You are forcing people to consume your pollution. What's the effect of that on their income? And their, we don't know. You could think of forcing people to consume that pollution as being a complement to consuming energy or a substitute to consuming energy. That is, when, they, when the world becomes more polluted, that may cause them to consume less energy or consume more energy. And that's the right way to think about that analysis. And that's probably all I have to say on it because we don't really have a good way of answering that question. Or we don't have a good answer. We have ways to do that analysis. But I don't think we've really done it in a way that's very convincing. OK, second point that comes out of this model. There is a tension between rebound and the idea of an energy efficiency gap. So the idea of an energy efficiency gap is people are not even making privately optimal energy efficiency decisions. They are leaving $20 bills on the ground. Uh, and the idea is people really don't really optimize very well. I think there are really good reasons to think, to think this is the case. Um, one is that uh, electricity is probably the least salient thing we consume in, our entire consumption bundle. Most people don't know when they're consuming it, how much they're consuming, how to reduce consumption. The analogy that gets used often about getting your electricity bill is it's like going to the supermarket, filling up your cart, and they just tell you, you owe $120, but they don't tell you which things you pay cost how much. And so how could you actually economize? If that's the case, then people have a very hard time making efficient decisions with respect to energy consumption. And as a result, they leave $20 bills on the ground. And that's, that's a plausible argument. Another argument is the principal agent problem or the landlord tenant problem that somebody else is making the decision. And within firms, this is also a problem that you're not the one who pays. Your division doesn't pay the energy bill, but you're buying a new refrigerator. Why should you buy an energy efficient refrigerator? The landlord likely also in that case is buying, an energy, uh, buying a refrigerator for you, but they don't pay the bills. So that's the idea of an energy efficiency gap. But the problem is, when we talk about rebound, we're talking about people optimally readjusting to these changes in prices. Now, income effect rebound, probably that's fine, because you don't have to know where the money came from if it's in your checking account. You just spend it. 
But substitution effect rebound is pretty hard to justify if you actually think people don't optimize very well. And so this idea that people are going to drive their cars more because they have a more energy efficient car relies on the idea that people are actually optimizing on that. And that's fine, and that may be the case. But you can't claim that and claim people aren't optimizing on gasoline use because they don't really pay attention to how much gasoline costs. At least that's going to undermine this argument about rebound. So, you, so this idea that people are, we need regulate, and particularly, by the way, if you, if you impose what the Department of Energy will say is cost effective energy efficiency standards, so a refrigerator has to at least have so much insulation, or a car has to at least get such fuel economy. Who is that going to affect? If you think that the problem is there's some people who don't really optimize on this, it's going to, the people who will be affected by the standards are the people who aren't optimizing. And yet rebound, substitution effect rebound is then arguing, and then they turn around and they perfectly optimize in response to this new marginal price of electricity. And I think that's a real tension. I, my favorite example is the landlord-tenant problem. The way you get rebound with a refrigerator, the standard discussion is when you make the refrigerator more energy efficient, people will find it cost effective to buy a bigger refrigerator because it doesn't cost as much to run it now. Um, that may be true, but if you're arguing landlords tend to buy inefficient refrigerators, it's pretty hard to make the argument that, but when we force them to buy efficient refrigerators, they're then going to say, oh, in that case, I'm going to buy the tenant a really large refrigerator. The, principal, the same principal agent problem that has undermined, the, that has caused the energy efficiency gap is also going to undermine that sort of substitution effect rebound. In contrast, if you actually think consumers optimize well, then it's pretty hard to argue that there's income effect rebound. Because they've already done all the cost effective stuff. Because you, were, you just said, well, consumers are actually good at this. Well, if that's the case, then when you force these regulations on them, it's very likely going to make them poorer, and you're going to get negative rebound. Uh, so you can't argue, on the one hand, people are really good optimizers, and yet this is a great income effect. The, the, there's a lot of income effect rebound from regulating them to, be, to choose more energy efficient outcomes. Um, I think I better move a little faster. Uh, there's a standard argument that to economists is, I think, just completely misguided, that you can't have much rebound because there are time constraints. People can't drive their car that much. That's right, but that's what's in a demand curve. It's already taken account of. There's nothing new in that claim. If you know something about the elasticity of demand, then you already know something about that. There's an argument, you know, the idea that if you make air travel 20% as expensive, people aren't going to travel an infinite amount of time, uh, um, travel an infinite amount because they just don't have enough time. And that's true. And that's what the demand curve for air travel is. Likewise, this is true in energy use. Um, uh, I think I'm going to move on. OK, so the big argument that um, Jevons made and Owen and many of the uh, backfire crowd make is that energy efficiency br causes technological change, and it's the technological change that, um, that incre increases energy use. Um, and there's no question about this. Technological change is you know, what's made us as rich as we are today. And making us rich systematically makes us use more energy. That's just true. That is true of all technological change, not just technological change in energy efficiency. And Jevons, well, I, Owen in his article essentially attributed all our increased use of energy to improvement in the energy efficiency, uh, uh, in energy efficiency as opposed to all the other things, ways technology has changed. Um, it definitely will create energy biased R&D, that is, and this is what Jevons is talking about. When we made the steam engine so much more efficient, people started thinking about ways to use the steam engine, which is energy biased technological change, technological change that focuses on using that more. And that's absolutely right. There are a couple still caveats to that. One is there's a lot of research and development that goes on that fails. 
So at least if you're going to start counting this sort of innovation, you also have to count the negative income effect of all the stuff you spend money on that never works out. Um, now, nobody thinks that on net it's a loser, but the right, the right argument certainly has to uh, include that negative income effect as well. Um, the substitution effect, this tilting towards energy use through energy bias, technological change is right. But even there, when we do that calculation, we have to be sure to net out what we're substituting away from. So we got an income effect, but we also have to count this substitution effect that when we use more of this, when we start using steam engines to drive trains um, and to move people, which was the big innovation, then we're spending money on that and not on something else. And that stuff used energy, horses. Um, and so we have to count the savings in energy on the other side. The other thing that the backfire folks really focus on is what's called economy-wide rebound. Um, and I just did some back-of-the-envelope calculations to try to get an idea of this. And they were pretty disturbing. And this is a place where I think we need a lot more research. And the, the primary idea here is endogenous energy prices. Um, and that is that when you use less energy, the price of energy drops. This is mostly focused on oil. And when the price of oil drops, somebody else in the world consumes more of it. And the extreme case is that when it drops, somebody consumes so much more, they fully offset your savings. Um, that's right. I'm going to come back and talk about that in a little more detail in a second. Let me talk about the other one. The other is a sort of fuzzy idea that shows up in the literature of a macroeconomic multiplier. That when a, uh, an innovation occurs that suddenly makes us richer because we can get the same services for less energy, not only do you gain, but, you're, but that has a multiplier effect within the economy. Macroeconomists have been arguing about this for a long time. Uh, this isn't exactly the standard stimulus multiplier they argue about during recessions. But the, the literature on here is something that still needs a lot of work. We really don't know how big this effect is, or even if there is such an effect um, in normal times. Let me talk about oil price effect rebound, though. So my mental model of the oil market is a supply curve that looks maybe like that or maybe like that. Probably not like that, not, probably not that linear one, which has an elasticity of one. Um, but th that's the general idea. Maybe your mental model is a flat supply curve. But my understanding is there's a lot of cheap oil out there. And that the reason the price of oil is so high right now is because the supply curve gets pretty steep at that point. If that's the case, these numbers are pretty scary. If you think that this red line, which is a 0.2 supply elasticity of oil, it, uh, is accurate. These are the percentage rebound effects get, given the world demand elasticity for oil. And they're large. And so this idea that what that's saying is if this idea that if you use less oil, somebody else elsewhere and the price drops a little bit and somebody else in the rest of the world steps up and uses more oil, that could actually be a big problem. It, of course, these, e these elasticity numbers, of course, depend on what the rest of the world is doing technologically. So I think the moral to take away from this is not we can never make any progress, but if all we do, and I think this is a real problem in California right now, is focus on reducing our greenhouse gas footprint, this sort of energy price effect rebound could mostly undo it, possibly completely undo it. And I think my own view is that this has become a major problem with California energy policy. We have sort of forgotten that the point is to solve global climate change, not California climate change. And we keep going with policies that will make us feel better because our green, measured greenhouse gas footprint will be smaller, but aren't going to actually solve the global problem. Uh, and this, I think, is a good example of that. OK. Let me finish up by talking about implications for measurement. And if, this, if you're going to take anything away from the talk, there are a few numbers here I think are pretty interesting. Um, how big could this income effect rebound be? And, to do, it's, and these are just simple calculations, but I think that I haven't seen them before and they're important. First of all, if you divide the total G energy use by uh, GDP, you get 6,472 BTUs per dollar. That is the average energy intensity of the US economy. 
that's a good first start on how much, it, uh, do we, how much more energy do we use when we get richer. That's the marginal energy intensity, but I'm going to use the average as a starting point, and then we can argue about whether it's larger or smaller. If you think that's the case, if you think the long run uh, marginal cost of gasoline is $3 a gallon, it's using 47,498 4, 47, BTUs per dollar. When you save a dollar on gasoline, but then spend it on the rest of the economy, you end up with that rebound. That rebound turns out to be 14%. When you do it for electricity and you save at 8 cents per kilowatt hour, you get this number. That rebound turns out to be about 6%. When you do it for natural gas, which is very cheap, and this is actually even at $5 per million BTU, uh, this includes the energy used in production, uh, you get a 3% income effect rebound. I view these as bare minimum. You cannot talk about rebound and come up with numbers smaller than this. So the people who say, look, this is just 1%, it's negligible, I think that they really aren't doing the calculation correctly. Um, on the other hand, of course, these aren't very large numbers compared to what people talk about about backfire. Um, an interesting question that always comes up is, what about the cost of the upgrade in the embodied energy? And in the paper, I show that, in fact, it is the, the only thing that matters when you, talk, when you want to include the upgrade itself, that is, whatever energy it takes to make the thing more energy efficient, is what is the energy intensity of that upgrade versus the energy intensity of the economy as a whole? Because if it's about the same, put it, if putting more insulation in a refrigerator you have, costs about the same in energy intensity per dollar of creating that, uh, that insulation as the economy as a whole, then it's neutral to that. You've lost a little income, but you've spent it on something that's about the same energy intensity as the rest of the economy. Okay, so finally what I do in the, the paper, uh, uh, which I put up the, it's available on my website, if you just Google my name, you'll find me, um, is I, uh, is I do some calculations for two, two illustrative calculations for two policies. Um, what I find is that Jevons and Owens are partially correct. The short run measures of demand change are clearly misleading. The full measure has to account for long run substitution and innovation. Um, what I'm going to show you, and I want to be real clear on this, what I'm going to show you accounts for the full substitution effect. That is not just the substitution to, but the substitution away. And what I would say is the full income effect. That is not just the income to the buyer, but the lost income to the seller when price exceeds marginal cost. I'm going to be explicit about how I do that. OK, so this is the calculation for doubling fuel economy. So I look at a, I did this calculation for auto last 15 years, gets driven 12,000 miles per year, starts at 25, goes to 50. I actually modeled this on the Ford Focus. Uh, the cost of the upgrade is $3,000. The non-fuel long run marginal cost per mile, because remember, when you drive the car more, you also spend stuff on stuff that's not fuel, which I take to have the energy intensity of the economy as a whole. Um, 19 cents, I use a 3% real discount rate. I make this distinction, which I'll make when I get to lighting in a second as well, between the retail price, which is what you're doing your substitution on, because that's what you decide how much to consume based on, and the long run marginal cost, which is what we use to do the income effect uh, calculation. And when you do that, you come up with an income effect of 11%. The substitution effect depends on how much more you think you'll drive. And here's where I'm just punting. I, you know, this paper, this, the name of the paper that this talk is based on is a framework for evaluating energy efficiency. I'm not trying to give you the last word. So you can pick the number you want. Uh, small, Ken Small at UC Irvine did an analysis that came up with a, thir a substitution effect of minus 0.2 an elasticity. If you think that's the case, then the total rebound is about 24%. 11% income effect, 13% substitution effect. I also do the greenhouse gas rebound, uh, and that turns out to be about 27% in this case. So what this has done is it's taken these concepts of taking the full substitution effect into account, 
and taking into account the full income effect. What it hasn't done is this idea, uh, this tension between energy efficiency rebound and the energy efficiency gap. If you really think that the people who are affected by, let's say, a regulation that improves energy efficiency are not these 0.2 guys, they're 0.05 guys because they're the ones who never pay attention to the price of gasoline anyway, then this number is going to be smaller. On the other hand, I also didn't take into account that, Mac, that um, energy price effect rebound, that oil stuff that I think is potentially very large. Um, and so that's not in here either. I just want to be clear on what this calculation is. I'm embarrassed to still have, I started writing this paper a year ago, and I think CFLs were sort of a technology a year ago. I think they're sort of dead now. Um, I, it's hard to imagine them being around five years from now. LEDs are moving so fast and getting cheap so fast um, that I think they will pretty much completely supplant CFLs, and the light is so much better than CFLs. Um, so I'm going to focus on the CFLs. Uh, $15, they're actually down for a 60 watt bulb, they're actually down closer to $10 now. Uh, some people are going to argue with this incandescent that that's too high, but that turns out to make no difference in the, almost no difference in the calculation. Here again, I make this distinction between the retail price of electricity, which this is not California, by the way. This is national, 11 cents. California average is 17 or 18. Marginal for many of us is 30 or 40. The long run marginal cost of electricity is 8 cents. Um, so when we think about an income effect, we want to base it on that long run marginal cost. How many, and I base this on hours used per day, but actually my colleague and friend Chris Knittel pointed out that uh, there is a huge variation. And in fact, that light bulb in your attic or your cellar that goes on once every two weeks, incandescent bulbs are probably just fine for that. In fact, that's probably what you should be using. On the other hand, there's an interesting policy uh, debate to have about given that we got a policy can't be that nuanced, how big a loss is it to force people to put the LED in there? And that's probably also pretty small. Um, that's just not where the primary lighting is going on. So you do this calculation, you get a pretty small income effect. Um, these things are all energy. So when you're saving on this, you're saving all energy. Um, and the, the energy intensity of these is much higher than the energy intensity of the economy. So when you respend those savings, you don't really make up much of that. So that's the, why the income effect is so small. The substitution effect depends entirely on what you think the long run elasticity of demand for lighting is. And there are a couple papers on it, and I have used one of them. I will not swear to these numbers. The fact is, we light our houses massively more than we used to, but for a whole bunch of reasons. And it's hard to know how much of that is the price of lighting. The paper that does this calculation admits that you can't really do an adjustment for the hassle of lighting candles and the fire danger and all the other things that you would want to account for. The paper, by the way, is called 700 Years of Lighting um, and tries to calculate. And this is the 0.6 is the elasticity estimate for the last decade they estimated it for. And so if that's the case, you get a pretty big substitution effect rebound and a total of about rebound of about 30%. And that's driven largely not by the income effect, because the income effect is pretty small, because all the money you're saving, you're saving on energy directly. Um, and it's because lighting is so much more energy intensive than the economy as a whole. You're saving it because of this substitution, or you, the rebound is because of this substitution that you use a lot more lighting. And remember, when you use a lot more lighting, you're using less of something else, but because lighting is so energy intensive, that's not getting you much back in that, this case. And then I do a GHG calculation as well um, for lighting, which of course is driven very much by what you think the marginal uh, uh, generation is that this electricity was using. Okay, I got a couple more minutes, let me finish. I'm an economist, I can't finish a talk on rebound without reminding people, energy efficiency rebound is a good thing. It is value creation. It is people re-optimizing in response to something getting cheaper. 
In every other dimension of the economy, we consider that a good thing. And I have a blog post on this that says it's even a good thing here if we harness that gain. Because remember, what people are doing is they're saying this is cheaper. Because this is cheaper, I, I am better off if I use more of it. Great. But we're also going to make you pay more for some other energy use. Or we're going to raise taxes or prices of greenhouse gas. So what it allows you to do is make people equally well off while reducing their greenhouse gas footprint. Um, so you can't, so this idea that rebound's a problem, I think, is uh, misguided. But if we're going to do policy, we do have to have some, we have to think hard about how much is rebound? How much are we really going to get? And the people who ignore rebound and say, we're, this is going to be this much more energy efficient, so we save all that energy, I think are really not right. I think this framework demonstrates that when you think carefully about it, you are going to have to give back the numbers I 10 to 40 percent is the ballpark. Um, and that's before you start talking about this price effect rebound. Um, uh, yeah, I said that. Um, energy efficiency is a big economic boost, or is, is a bigger economic boost with rebound. Um, it's a $25 bill laying on the ground instead of a $20 bill. Um, there is still this real question about what is the actual uh, performance of energy efficiency. And I think that's a bigger issue that the evaluation crowd has not done a great job of getting the counterfactual right that really can let us know exactly how much we're getting. OK, I will wrap up. Um, the idea here was to carefully dissect energy efficiency rebound in a framework that allows us to really parse out the different pieces of it and see what the implications are. And I think that has some important implications on thinking about the income effect and the full income effect, which is likely smaller than people have generally thought about when you recognize it's the marginal cost income effect, not the retail price. This tension between energy efficiency gap and optimizing response uh, probably tells us that rebound is not as large for the people who are really affected by these regulations if they're the ones who weren't really optimizing. Um, it also helps clarify some of the measurement issues that we have to face. Um, income effect turns out to be pretty easy, although there is, I think, still this issue of what's the true marginal intensity of money people spend. Um, the substitution innovation effects, I think, are still very challenging. Um, this economy-wide rebound, which is the name that encompasses this price, energy price effect rebound, uh, that, I think, is a big challenge. And I think it also should motivate us to recognize we really need to be exporting policies so that when we use less oil, it's not just sucked up by the rest of the world. Um, and that rebound is value creation. Um, thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. We have time for questions. And again, like usual, we'll start with the students. Yeah. How about back over there? Uh, so a couple of things that you mentioned during your, you alluded to it a couple times during your talk, was this notion of extending economic policy, making economic policy in California that, it, that doesn't make just us feel good about ourselves, but actually extends that beyond California. That's pretty interesting. So how would you actually go about doing that? As a legislature, as a legislator in California, or someone crafting policy in California. Okay, this is a little off topic, but I'll do one minute, and then I'll, uh, I think we are focusing way too much on technologies that really don't. We, we are not focusing enough on learning whenever we spend money, because all that matters is the learning. That what California, California actually reducing its greenhouse gas footprint doesn't matter. Well, it might matter from a leadership point of view, but then we should be quantifying that. Um, but mostly what we should be focusing on is, can this technology be exported to the developing world in a cost-effective way? Because that's the whole ballgame. If we can do that, we can address climate change. If we can't do that, all we're going to do is feel good about ourselves. And so every expenditure should be put to that test. Is this actually advancing technologies that can be exported to the developing world? And I think that that would push us much more, not entirely, but much more towards R&D investment. It would push us much less towards putting solar panels on people's roofs, um, which I think is out at the other end of making us feel good and not actually changing the world. Thank you. OK, more students. 
This is your chance. Okay. All right. Yeah, we'll open it up to anyone. Okay. Yeah. Back there. Have you heard about the New Apollo Alliance analysis by the Bergen Group in Texas? I have heard that name. I don't know what it is. They did an input-output an input analysis of uh, the New Apollo Alliance program, which was putting money into low-income communities and cities being educated and trained to do energy efficiency and quality of building retrofits, and then um, also being paid to do those jobs. And so focusing all the energy on the low income community and then once that's done, then the same team of people can go out and do the next round out in the suburbs, the next round up. And they show huge benefits to the overall economy from doing that. Okay, so yeah, so this I don't want to get into the green jobs debate. Um, I will just say I share the view of almost all economists that it is by and large misguided and that the net effect on investing in energy efficiency in terms of jobs is pretty small. Um, not that, and by the way, and I also the net effect uh, of Keystone is pretty small. All of these things that, as my colleague at Harvard, Rob Staven, said, you know, you're, he talked about the analogy is you're having friends over for dinner, and before they arrive, you have to take a shower and make a salad, but that doesn't mean you should make the salad in the shower. Uh, we're trying to solve two different problems here, and I don't think we should focus our climate policy on job creation. Some of it is good job creation, some of it isn't, but um, I think most of those estimates are wild guesses. But that's my view. Okay, how about back over there and then we'll come to the side. Um, I completely agree with your analysis that in addition to the income effect, there, there is a real substitution effect where people do pay attention to the price of energy and what they buy. But how do you see on a scale from the argument that people don't at all cost out the price of energy to the argument that they perfectly cost it out and sort of discount the cash flows and do everything economically efficiently. How do you see the way that in real life people make decisions about energy costs? So there's actually a lot of research going on on this. Unfortunately, most of it's on the gasoline side. And what it finds is people are actually pretty good at doing the net present value analysis of how much is it worth to save to have one MPG better gallon uh, mileage on cars. But that's not all that reassuring because every person in this room knows what gasoline costs. And every person in this room who has a car has a pretty good idea of the mileage of their car. And every person in this room, or many people in this room, have no idea what electricity costs. And me, many people in this room don't even know the units the natural gas is sold in. And so the idea that people optimize pretty well on gasoline doesn't really warm my heart that much. I think on the gasoline and cars is probably pretty far on the optimizing end. I think that buying refrigerators is probably pretty far on the non-optimizing end. People really don't understand it. It's not salient. And I think that's where the real benefits are likely to be. Um, and I think that's also where when you make even a, forget about landlord tenant, when you make even a person, a regular person, buy a more energy efficient refrigerator, I think that since they're not really optimizers on that to begin with, it's probably pretty small effect that they say, well, in that case, I'm going to buy a bigger refrigerator, which would be the substitution effect. Um, likewise, I think it's not the case that people buy two televisions because they find out that the television is more energy efficient. Um, and so I think those effects are small. Whereas it is the case that when people find out their car is more fuel efficient, they probably do drive more because it's more salient. OK, we'll do Charlie and then Adam. Yeah. Um, I really enjoyed this talk. Uh, the model provided a lot of insight, and I'm, I'm sure that it can predict which sectors and which appliances will show the, the, the strongest rebound effect or less strong rebound effect. So I was wondering if you've applied it to any real life examples or data, and I was wondering how testable it truly is. Well, in a sense, the model isn't, the point of the model isn't testing it. In a sense, it's a framework for parsing it. So I, I don't know when you actually take this to data, well, I tried to do illustrative calculation, but it's going to, what, I mean, in a sense, it's a, the model is a tautology. It just says, here's what changes. 
Um, and so the question is, when you parse it that way, how, do you, how, how big are those effects? And so you know, I tried to take it to lighting. And frankly, I believe deeply in, let me say more generally, I believe deeply in these income effect um, estimates. I believe much less deeply in the substitution effect estimates, because the substitution effect estimates really are all over the map. We, you know, if you ask how much more light, do we light our houses because electricity is cheap? More. I'm, I'm pretty sure. More. Um, but, and when I put in LEDs, of course I'm director of the Energy Institute and I know a lot more than most, but when I put in LED lights, or actually CFLs, in our outdoor lighting, I was much more comfortable leaving the lights on at night because they don't use much electricity, and I know how much electricity they use. Um, but I think that extrapolating me or anybody who came to this talk to the rest of the world is probably not very bright. OK, Adam. It seems like the large part of this much more fuzzily defined economy-wide rebound is a bit of a longer term sort of effect, or maybe well, it's obviously larger in scale um, and perhaps longer term. In what sense do you? Do you see habit formation and sort of maybe you could call it history system the demand curve or um, something like this coming into this economy-wide effect? That is, we make gasoline cheaper. Somebody on the margin in China buys a car. Their children and other people around them grow up with the expectation that you have an automobile as part of what you have as a person. And they build cities that rely on cars yeah. and all so, of that. So how, in the long run, it seems like this is going to swamp all these other sorts of things. Is, is that your sense as well, or, or at least? be sort of of the next order of magnitude. Large. I think that's a much bigger deal with oil than with coal or natural gas. I think those curves for coal and natural gas are much, for coal, I think they're pretty darn flat. For natural gas, they're probably pretty flat. Um, with oil, well, we can have this discussion. You know more than I do. But guessing at what the long run supply, uh, supply elasticity of oil is, is tough. But my sense is that that's pretty steep, and that is a problem. And, but I think what that says is when we make policy about reducing our use of oil, we also have to be thinking hard about getting the developing world to not just fill in, to encourage them to also develop in ways that are not going to just suck up all that extra oil. OK. All right, let's go to the back, the far back. Yeah. Me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, my water bill in December in Palo Alto was $305. And uh, I think that the models and the work you could do would be much better spent, much more useful if you spent time modeling how to uh, save and how to produce water. Well, I, I, I will reassure you, I'm not going to do that. But there are people who are working on that problem. They're just not me, and that isn't this talk. But, but it, that is not being ignored. Both I know at Berkeley and Davis, and I suspect at Stanford as well, there are economists and hydrologists studying water at a deep level. And I think there's room for both uh, policy problems to be worked on. I, I've heard of it. <laughs> OK, so I, I have a question for yeah. you. You know, in light of you know, what you've been studying and in light of your challenge to look at the developing world, and you know, if that's not where our you know, sites are, that we're sort of you know, missing the point. So, so you know, in the developing world, you know, there's a tremendous need and opportunity to try to you know, start out with a much more efficient a set of appliances and so forth. So, so what do you take from this with regard to you know developing world and you know maybe even parse it up into places like China, which you know with a stronger central government versus places like India or, or Pakistan or. You know. Well, one of the things we're learning about China, I think, is the strong central government idea is it's, not really it's, accurate. It's the the exactly strong central so. government with a lot of local governments do whatever right. the hell yeah. they want anyway. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I, no, but I, I think this has a very direct implication that um, both the, uh, the price effect rebound, but also when we think about income effect rebound and, in, and income growth. So Catherine Wolf from my colleague at Berkeley has done some very interesting work 
on when economies start to become more energy intensive. And she finds basically an S-curve effect that the very poor level, when they get richer, they still don't use much energy. And then they hit this cusp where they start buying appliances. And it's pretty clear that China is at or moving up that cusp right now. And so focusing policy in ways that capture that at a time, because they're making investments that are, in some cases are going to last a decade, but in some cases are going to last many decades. Um, and that, that is when we really need to focus on it. Uh, the lar I punted the question because the response should be, OK, how do we focus on it? Mm -hmm. And frankly, I don't have a good uh -huh. answer for that. Right. I just It has really made me appreciate much more, though I've been saying this for years, that we need to think about what works in the developing world. But it's made me appreciate more, even when we think about our own energy efficiency, it's going to really matter to think about when we think about rebound and the rebound that's going to go on in China, what that does. Um, and when we, I mean, I didn't really touch on it, but when you apply this framework in the developing world, in many cases, the income effect can be much larger. Right. And then it becomes much more worrisome. Right. OK. All right. Any more questions? Yeah. Um, OK. How about, so I'm trying to sort of ask, get everyone one chance. So yeah, how about you? Yeah. So how, how does this mesh with, say, long-term infrastructure investments versus if you think cost of energy might go up or down, particularly up? I'm trying uh, well, well, no, to say more. I'm, uh, yeah, well, so, so particularly if you're, say, if you're putting in the infrastructure, it's going to last Oh, OK, years, I see what you're saying. But you think the price of oil is going to be a lot more. You know, how does that affect what you do? Yeah, so I mean, in a sense, this gets back to this question of hysteresis and the, the fact that these are long-lived investments. And when we think about making these energy efficiency investments, we do need to think about, and particularly on the substitution effect, what, you are, what paths you are making available. So you know, urban planning becomes a really big deal, of course, when we start thinking about rebound in energy efficiency. Uh, in fuel economy. If we're going to make things more fuel econ economic, what we'd really like to do is not say, 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 have people say, well, in that case, I can live two hours away because now it doesn't cost me much to do that commuting. And, uh, you know, I'm an economist. The uh, caricature of economists is they think the market solves it all. And there were economists in the 1970s who may have thought that. But by and large, most economists are more broad-minded. I certainly think that there is a role for urban planning, for thinking carefully about these network effects. Um, and uh, I can't say more than that. OK. Well, I think we should wrap up. So Thank thanks you. very much. <laughs>